Well, hello, everybody. Good evening. I am coming to you live from my living room in Somerville, Massachusetts. And we are here for the next hour for what I hope will be the best Zoom meeting of your day. This is, of course, Boston Talks with GBH's Curiosity Guy. I am that guy, Edgar B. Herwick III, the host of GBH's Curiosity Desk. Uh, we've got a theme for tonight that I'm really excited about, which is travel and traveling safely during the COVID crisis. And we've got two great speakers who I am really excited to speak with tonight. Abrar Karan, who is going to address some of those safety issues, and Christopher Muther, who is a travel writer and is going to talk about a little bit of the travel side of things. I have a lot of questions for them. Key here is that we hope you also have a lot of questions for them too. I'm going to sort of be your guide for the evening and also the media through which we will get those questions to our speakers. And right now I'm going to kick it over to my colleague Liz, who will explain exactly how you can participate. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon, this evening, I should say. It's kind of early on, but what you wanna do when you wanna to talk to us today is go down to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and just type in your name, the town you're from and what your question is. We'll be here monitoring that and sharing those with Edgar and everyone else. So thanks very much. All right, so uh, there you go. Keep your eyes on that Q&A. Also, if you see a question that you like in that Q&A, give it a thumbs up. I'm gonna be keeping an eye on that as I'm speaking with our guests tonight. And uh, I'll try to get to as many of your questions as I possibly can. So without further ado, let's get our first guest up on the screen with me here. Uh, this is Dr. Abrar Karan. Uh, he's a doctor of internal medicine at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, as well as Harvard Medical School. Uh, and as I understand, Abrar, uh, sort of a, a specialty in uh, emerging infectious diseases, which sounds like uh, something that might be pretty important for all of us right now. Hey Edgar, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having me tonight. And and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, emerging infections are definitely on everybody's mind, not just my, not just mine. Uh, and usually it's just mine and a few other people. So I'm glad to see that others are interested now. Well, we're very glad that there are people like you who, uh, prior to this and when this is all over, will be looking at this day in and day out and keeping an eye on things for us so that we can understand what to do when this stuff happens. So speaking of that, Abrar, I want to kind of start off. Uh, by asking you a question, you know, we are now months and months into this uh, epidemic. And, you know, I, I'm sort of wondering, you know, if you can give us just a little thumbnail sketch right now of like, what's the sort of best practices for safety, whether we're traveling somewhere or not. You know, I remember there was a lot of stuff early on. We didn't know much. There was some conflicting information. We're now so far into this that I wonder if you can kind of give us a little bit of an update on sort of where things stand about what we know and don't know and what we should be doing and not doing right now. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the, the benefit of now is that we've got the experiences of the last few months. So we, we know a lot more now than we did initially. Uh, the most um, important and one of the most obvious uh, areas was around masking. So there was a lot of confusion initially around whether or not people in the community setting needed to be wearing a mask. Um, other countries have been masking for a long time. Um, they've, they've other countries, uh, some Asian countries that have dealt with other um, outbreaks of viral respiratory pathogens um, have already kind of gone through something similar uh, in years past. And so masks are more commonly used. But here in the US, um, it was certainly a cultural change to use masks. Um, some of the initial hesitations around this was um, some public health officials felt that if people wore masks, perhaps would that cause them to physically distance less from other people or to get involved in situations that may be high risk? And at that time, there were many of us that were pushing back because the same arguments had been used against things like seatbelts, where they said when seatbelts were introduced, people said maybe people will drive more recklessly if they have seatbelts on. And that didn't really pan out. So we know that masks work, they work well. Um, we now obviously have um, uh, mask uh, mandates in certain circumstances like in hospitals and um, in different stores um, and, and some travel um, uh, modalities as well. Although there is not a mask mandate across the country. So you'll see that um, in some places people are not wearing masks in some states, people may not be wearing masks in places where they would in other states. So that's one aspect of it. The other key aspect I would say is that we understand a little bit better how this virus transmits 
uh, in terms of the overall population transmission patterns. And what I mean by that is that not everybody passes the virus on to the same number of people. And this is where you get to super spreading events and super spreading people. And we think that about 20% or so of people are responsible for about 80% of spread, which means that there's some people that spread to a lot of people and a lot of people don't spread to any people at all. So we know that. And what that means is that we have to stop these super spreading clusters. Um, and those clusters happen under circumstances that we actually understand quite well now, primarily indoors, crowded, close um, contact face to face um, for an extended period of time in areas that have poor ventilation. So we've seen and have several reports of different clusters in different um, places. So one recent one was at a hockey, an indoor hockey game. Um, one that was early on in the epidemic was at a wedding that was indoors. Um, we've seen um, some from, from uh, different restaurants. Uh, we've seen them in indoor exercise classes where people are re breathing really heavily. And so the key is actually to avoid these kind of events that can propagate a lot of spread and, and large numbers of cases. So I'd say those are two big ones. Um, the other thing that we now understand better is that people can spread the virus with no symptoms at all. So some people never develop symptoms, uh, we call them asymptomatic, and other people develop symptoms, um, uh, but, but they start transmitting the virus even before those symptoms, and we call those pre-symptomatic. And so the, the invisible spread of COVID-19 is really what, what many of us have called its Achilles, the Achilles heel of stopping this virus. It's extremely hard to trace it down and stop it when people are transmitting it with no symptoms at all, because they may think that they're safe and they're not at uh, risking um, others around them uh, getting sick. So those are some of the important points um, that I would kind of start with. Good stuff, good stuff. All right, I'm talking with Abrar Karan. Uh, we're talking about safety. You know, we're focused on travel and we're heading into a time of year where we've got Thanksgiving coming up, we've got the holiday season, we've got the winter time where people get the blues and try to get away. So travel, I think, on the mind of a lot of people. And I've got some great questions already popping up in the Q&A related to that. So I'm going to go over to uh, Mary C. in Princeton, Massachusetts. Uh, Abrar, she wants to know, uh, is she traveling internationally, do you have recommendations about testing strategies for pre-departure and upon return to Massachusetts? And I, and I think I'd, I'd like you to sort of expound on that, even if you're not flying internationally, if you're thinking about travel, even say out of state, home to your parents' house or something for Thanksgiving, testing strategies, do you do it before, do you do it after, where, when, how, how do you yeah. do it? Absolutely, so testing is a critical part of this, um, but what's most important is to understand what a test does tell you and what a test doesn't tell you. So as you guys know, there are a few different types of tests, but I'll kind of run through the, the main test that people would use is um, the RT-PCR test. And this is a test that actually what it does is it, it detects if you've got any virus in you, whether that's um, live virus, meaning you're actually infected and you could be infecting other people, uh, but also it can detect uh, viral fragments for, time, uh, for the time after you've recovered as well. And so we've learned this by taking care of patients where some patients who were infected would test positive on the PCR for quite a while afterwards, some for weeks after, some even for a couple of months after. And we realized that what the test was picking up was actually just fragments of the virus is RNA, but it was not live virus that could actually cause um, an infection in other people. And so this test is extremely sensitive. Um, but you have to understand exactly what you're, what you're dealing with when you get a positive result or when you get a negative result. So let's say that you were going to be traveling somewhere and you want to take the test and see if you're infected at that time. So what that, so if you take your PCR test, um, let's say you get a negative result. What that tells you is that the day that you got swabbed, you did not have, um, you either did not have any virus in you at all, or you had such a small tiny amount, maybe right as you got infected or after you've already re um, recovered per se, um, and it's negative. But let's say that you had got that negative test right around when you had gotten an infection. What we found is that in certain circumstances, so there was a, a study published in a jail where they had tested a bunch of people and of the people uh, in the initial batch, the ones who tested negative, they tested them again four days later. And a number of those people then tested positive on the four day mark. And so you could posit that those people may actually have just been developing infection and they could be, and then they got sick a few days later. And, and some of the, a lot of them didn't show any symptoms. So, so what does this all mean? So let's say I got a negative test and then I decide I'm going to fly out to go see my family, which I've already been in this circumstance. 
So what happens is I know that I was negative the day that I got tested. And let's say I flew out the next day. It's, it's possible, although unlikely, that in the period of time between when I got my test and then the next couple of days afterwards that I could develop the, the illness if I had been exposed and infected. And so now I may have just arrived somewhere and I may think, oh, okay, well, I'm, I just got tested a couple of days ago. I'm totally fine. I may not show symptoms and I could inadvertently infect somebody. Now that's not going to happen that often, but it's possible that that sort of setup is possible. So when I traveled home uh, to see my family, I hadn't seen my, my uh, family in quite a while. They live on the West coast. What I ended up doing was when we were indoors, even though I got a test and I was negative for several days afterwards, I wore a mask inside. Um, now, when we went outside to hang out in the backyard, uh, you know, we, I would take it off and we'd kind of be physically distanced, but the, we know viral spread is just much lower outdoors. So that was one strategy, masking for a few days after. The other thing you might do is when you land, um, maybe a day or two after, you can get tested again and just make sure that there was nothing that happened in the interim. Now, that may bring up what happens in the plane or when you travel. Well, we know that spread in planes is actually not that common, especially because planes have really good ventilation. They have HEPA filtration every 15 or so minutes where they're exchanging air and people are masked on planes now. So the transmission that we saw on planes um, early in the epidemic was before people were masking. So that's a couple of thoughts. All right. So let, let's talk a little bit more about flying because I've got a number of questions from folks about flying. So um, uh, let's start with Sue, uh, who's asking just generally about safety with flying, which you started to talk about. Um, what about uh, what about if you have a, a pre-existing condition or you're sort of high risk that you really don't want to get the virus? Good idea to fly or not? And is there something you can do beyond a mask? Google, uh, goggles, a face shield, anything like that? Worth it? No? That's a great question. So, you know, the higher your individual risk is, uh, you may think you, you want to take as many precautions as possible. So every sort of decision that we make around COVID, uh, it really is around what is the possibility that I get the infection. And so there are no guarantees. There could be low risk events where you get it. There could be high risk events when you don't get it. Um, so let's say that you were going to be flying. I would say that masks are essential. Uh, think about where you're flying from. So are you flying from an area that has a lot of COVID transmission? So there, if you're flying out of a, a part of the country or a city where, there are, where they're surging and there's a peak of cases and you have a plane full of people going on, the chance that somebody has COVID on that flight is going to be higher than if you were flying from somewhere that has very low levels of community transmission. So that's one thing to think about. The next thing is how many people are on that flight? Are you going to have someone sitting next to you on the flight? Are you going to have space in between your seats on the flight? Uh, so that's important. So the couple of flights that I've taken, there was nobody in my row and there were hardly any people on the flight at all. And I think that travel is just much lower these days than it had been before. Um, eye protection is an important point. So you know, we just had a, uh, an outbreak at our hospital, uh, the one that I work at, and some of the uh, investigations that have been done have pointed to the importance of eye protection. So I think the primary mode of transmission is going to be inhalation through your mouth into your lungs and not necessarily into your eyes or your oral mucosa. And obviously us working in a hospital setting is still a little bit different than a community setting and certainly different than an airplane where the ventilation is very, very good. But I'd say that, you know, the um, it's all risk and uh, it's all cost to benefit. So what's the cost to you? You could put on some goggles for the flight. Maybe there's some benefit to that. Uh, it's certainly not going to harm you. So I would say that's the way I think about it. Yeah. What about what about like sort of basic things like at an airport or on the plane, like eating and drinking, right? Mm -hmm. Like just hydrating or whatever. Like you've got to take the mask off for a moment to do that. Is that a high risk moment? Is it like if I take this down for a second take, to take a sip, like how much danger did I just put myself in? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think that that's, you know, it points out that there are, there are little moments of sort of oversight that we, as we get more used to them, we'll think about them more, but we're used to all eating at the same time on flights, right? So they come around with snacks, they come around with food and drinks. And I would say that, you know, it would be advisable for you and the person next to you, if you don't know them, to not be taking your masks off at the same time for a prolonged period of time, right? So transmission usually will not happen in, in seconds, it's several minutes um, of exposure. But let's say for several minutes, the person right next to you, let's say there's no space between you two, and you're both eating or drinking at the same time, maybe you guys exchange a few words here and there, it's possible, right? It's certainly possible, it's certainly higher risk than if you waited until they were done eating or drinking and they put their mask back on, and then you took yours off to do the same. Generally, I'd say try to keep your mask on for as long as you can. 
if you take your mask down to take a sip of water or eat a snack briefly, try to just do it in a staggered way so you're not all taking your mask off at the same time. I like that. So that's like, so if you don't know the person next to you on the plane, take a moment, get to know them, strategize together. Yeah, I think that can work. All right, so let, let's let's move a, a little bit from flying to sort of driving. So if we're looking at the holidays and maybe you're going to see family and it's, you know, it's maybe more than you want to take in a clip. So you've, you're going to have to stop at a rest stop. You're going to have to stop and eat some way along the way, maybe even stay in a hotel along the way. Um, we have uh, uh, Marianne here who's watching, who sa says very similar. She wants to go visit her elderly parents uh, in Pennsylvania. So what do you do at a rest stop, restaurant, hotels? Can you stop? Is it safe to, is it not? And if you do, what's some best practices along the way? Yeah, those are all great questions and, and very important questions. So I'd say as you're traveling in a car, um, ideally you're gonna be traveling with somebody that you know, which is who is in your close social circle, meaning you probably live with them. In your bubble. In your bubble, exactly. Now, if you're if you're if you're bringing a friend who's hitching a ride with you, and you guys don't often see each other, well, I wouldn't advise that because you may be in the car together for quite a long amount of time. Um, but ideally, it's somebody that you're traveling with in your bubble, or you're traveling on your own, right? And so, a car is a great way to sort of avoid contact with other people, avoid crowds. Um, so now, let's say you're saying I'm going to stop to use the restroom, right, at a at a gas station. Keep your mask on. Wash your hands. So. The doorknobs are high touch points. A lot of people are touching bathroom doorknobs, even pre-COVID, we should be careful around these. Um, and so that's important, but keeping your mask on in the bathroom is also important. So there's actually one outbreak investigation. It was from a flight and they, they from the contact tracing that they did, they actually thought that the, it, the transmission happened when somebody else had used the bathroom um, that, that was asymptomatic at the time, but infectious. And then somebody else came into that bathroom after and was reportedly not wearing a mask because it was kind of pre-masking. And they, they think that this, the, the transmission may have happened by that shared bathroom time. Um, and so I'd say that if you're wearing your mask, I think it's very unlikely that that would happen. You're not in the bathroom for an extended period of time. Um, but I think that's really important. Is there a, you know, you know, we, we, there's a lot out there about like different kinds of masks and the, the, you know, how effective they are. So, you know, if I am looking at planning travel, either on a plane or a long trip in a car where I'm maybe going outside of what has been my comfort area, mm -hmm. is there a particular kind of mask or certain kinds of material that I should be trying to acquire as part of that planning? Yeah, so a lot of people have been looking into this and studying this, and this kind of gets into like the two main um, ways through the air by which uh, COVID transmits. So one is through droplets, which kind of are larger, they fall to the ground, they don't hang around in the air. And then there's aerosols, which are smaller particles that, that you emit both of these when you talk or speak loudly or sing, um, and the aerosols hang around in the air. And so the most common types of masks that we use are sort of cloth masks or surgical masks if you're in a healthcare setting. I've seen some people wearing um, KN95 masks, which are not uh, tested and approved in the US, and then N95 masks, which are primarily for healthcare workers, um, and those are tested and cleared here. Um, KN95s and N95 masks use electrostatic filtration, so what they do is they actually will stop these small particles um, using those forces. And, and that can be really important in situations where people are aerosolizing. And that's going to be in healthcare settings, um, but also really in a crowded areas that are indoors with poor ventilation. Airplanes have good ventilation again. So that is a really important factor. Um, your cloth masks, your surgical masks, they're going to block droplets, which we think are still the primary mode of transmission for COVID. So those will generally be good enough. And you know, the more that we study and see where outbreaks did and didn't happen, the difference was a lot more about if you were wearing a mask versus not wearing a mask and a little bit less so about if your mask was a little bit better than the guys next to you. Gotcha. Is there like, you know, one of the, one of my takeaways just in talking to you here is that, you know, I, I'm sort of feeling like hearing you talk about flying, for example, it sounds like flying maybe is sa safer than I thought it was if, you know, if you're sort of doing the right things like having your mask on, et cetera. What about like trains and like if I'm trying to make a decision like do I want to take a train do I want to drive or should I fly 
is there a, I mean, maybe there's not a one size fits all for this, but is there a like drive if you can, and if you can't fly and last resort is train or like, can you rank them? Or is yeah, it really dependent? It, it dependent on some of the factors I mentioned. So, you know, it's, it depends on where you live and what's the chance that that train or that plane gets filled up with people who, and then what are the, what's the chance that one or two or more of those people actually have COVID? especially in times when you're surging and you have epidemics uh, like waves that are coming through, you don't want to be getting into a lot of these like public transport where people are gonna be crowding in. So we've definitely seen reports of outbreaks from trains, from buses. Again, a lot of these were not, people not wearing masks and these are from earlier in the epidemic. Um, but I'd say that those are kind of your most important factors. And so I've taken trains as well um, from Boston to New York a couple of times. Um, you know, I, I waited for when it was much lower transmission in, in both places to do that. Um, and it wasn't, they weren't too crowded, but it's always hard to kind of predict these things. Um, and I don't, I don't have a car. If I did, I probably would have just driven. Um, so, you know, I'd say that the less, the fewer people that you come into contact with um, and the, the, the less time that you have to do that for, the better as a generality. But that's not going to be possible for everybody. And then you kind of weigh what is the reason that you're traveling? Um, why are you traveling? And how important is it to you? And what risk are you sort of willing to take? Um, now, you know, if we had the epidemic control throughout the country, we'd be in a much better place for all of this. Because then no matter where you are traveling to, it's kind of low risk. Because there is so much discrepancy around different parts of the country, you may be traveling from a high risk area to a low risk area, meaning you yourself may be introducing the virus to a community, or you may be traveling from a low risk area to a high risk one, and you may be exposing yourself to more risk actually by the place you're going to. Gotcha. Uh, we got a question here from Halver Iverson. Uh, uh, this is a great one. Question is, on a plane, should you turn that air fan blowing on you or not? That's a good question. I'm not, I'm, I, you know, I'm not sure about the answer to that in the sense that theoretically that will change the direction which the airflow would go. Um, so, I mean, if you blow it on you or if you blow it in a different direction, wherever you're blowing it, if you're not wearing a mask, it's going to blow your droplet sort of in that direction and then they'll fall and it may blow sort of some of the aerosols coming out in that direction as well. But to be honest, I'm not really sure if blowing it on you or blowing it to the side makes a big difference. Um, I, would, I, would, I would sort of defer that to some aerosol scientists who may study that a little bit more, but I haven't seen any really papers or studies on that regard, regarding COVID. Gotcha. Uh, how about uh, if you stay in a hotel? Uh, especially because, again, one of those things that I think has changed greatly from the beginning of this pandemic to now is an understanding of you know, how dangerous surfaces may or may not be. Uh, and I think one of the concerns that a lot of folks have about hotels is like, all right, I'm stepping into this, you know, room that theoretically somebody else stayed in, like, you know, there's all this stuff that they may have touched. Um, you know, so what about risks in a hotel? Uh, we got a question here and I just lost the name of who that came from, but yeah, no, best okay, hotel. So, yeah, hotels are interesting because you think about, let's say you walk into a hotel what are some things that may happen? You may have to wait in line um, to go check in at the counter. Uh, you may have to wait in line to get into an elevator. You may get into an elevator that could be crowded. You eventually get into your room. I think in your room itself, uh, as you think about sort of high touch point areas, uh, ideally, if the hotel has uh, anything public about what they're doing, that would be great if they sort of say that we're wiping down, cleaning all high touch point areas, we're keeping windows open between guests to allow ventilation in. I think those are all important um, things that they could be doing. Uh, remember, we have not seen uh, that much transmission via fomites. So fomites are basically objects that get infected by um, droplets that land on them. So if I were to sneeze on um, my computer, it could become a fomite if somebody else then touched it. But we don't think that that's the primary mode of transmission for COVID. Just based on a lot of the epidemiologic studies that have been done, and now what the CDC has concluded as well, so I wouldn't worry as much about that. I'd use hand sanitizer. I'd wash my hands just as I would advise um, at any time. Um, so I'd say those are a couple of the thoughts uh, because there's so many parts of staying at a hotel. But in your own room, I, I'd, I'd say as long as the hotel's using uh, general cleaning um, standards, it should be relatively safer. Gotcha. You know, we only got a couple minutes left, Abrar, and I wonder if you could, you know, kind of your 
dealing with this in a way that most people are not, which is to say you're kind of out there on the front lines and like you're in the medical field and presumably you're interacting with and seeing people suffering the effects of what, you know, this thing has been. So, um, you know, I don't know, like, what can you tell us about what you've learned and what you think people should be thinking about in terms of what's happening right now? <laughs> You know, yeah. no. So, you know, I was working on the COVID front lines in April um, in the emergency room at, um, at at Brigham Women's Hospital where I work, and I was working in the COVID pod where we saw a lot of COVID patients coming in, um, and so I was able to really hear about the stories, and I was also able to see, you know, all the different kinds of patients who are getting this disease and what it did to them. You know, there's so many cases I'll never forget, but there there's a few seeing fellow colleagues like healthcare workers who got sick themselves. I remember a nurse that I took care of said it felt almost like somebody was stabbing her. That's how painful it was for her just to breathe at that time. I, I'd never seen uh, a nurse uh, cry or in tears uh, unless it was for a patient, ne never for, for even themselves. And, you know, that was tough to see. I remember taking care of uh, families, multiple family members who got infected. Um, you know, some of the elder, more elderly ones died um, while other family members were still being taken care of. I remember on Mother's Day, um, you know, I was working on the wards and I was, I had to go fully dressed in PPE so I could help somebody FaceTime, a mother FaceTime with her daughter um, for Mother's Day because they couldn't even see each other, you know, and, and this mother was, was nearing the end of life um, and had COVID. These are tragic moments and we've seen very, very, um, we've seen people get sick of all ages, right? Even younger people who have comorbidities like obesity and things like that. We've seen those patients taking care of those patients. Those patients have ended up on ventilators. Some of those patients die. You know, my goal is not to create fear. It's not to scare people beyond what uh, level they, they need to be um, worried and how much they need to respect this virus. Um, it is true that people who are older are more likely to su suffer severe consequences. It is true that people with multiple medical conditions are going to be much sicker. And it is true that younger people who are healthy, um, you know, a number of them do okay in the sense that they don't die from this. Some of them have longstanding symptoms that we're still studying, we're still trying to understand. Um, so I would say that this virus is, is serious. It is the most difficult epidemic that we as a society have faced. Um, and it's not going away. It's not going away soon. Um, and so I think we need to all um, support each other and, and not let up, especially as we head into the winter where we're going to be spending a lot more time indoors um, and, and there's a lot more chance for the virus to spread. Get a flu shot? Yes? No? Yes. Get a flu shot as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Abrar Karan, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, share some of your expertise with us. I really appreciate you being with us. Thanks so much, Edgar. It's great to be on. All right, that was Abrar Karan, and uh, we are going to shortly uh, welcome Christopher Muther. Uh, and in, in before that, we're going to carry on a Boston Talks tradition and do a little interactive trivia with all of you. But before we get to any of that, I want to kick things over to my colleague, Sarah, for a minute with a very important message for you at home. Thanks, Edgar. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for spending an hour of your time with us during today's virtual event, GBH's Boston Talks Travel. GBH offers a wide variety of events to cure your curiosity, made possible thanks to people like you. If you haven't already, we encourage you to become a sustaining member or make a donation. Today, when you gift a $5 a month on our sustainer plan, you can choose to receive these now vintage WGBH logo, logo pattern socks with a W imprinted with radio towers, on-air language, and whimsical comet clouds as a thank you gift. These socks are unisex, soft, comfortable, and machine washable. Now more than ever, it's crucial to stay informed of what is happening in the world. And your backing helps us provide information that you can trust along with events that you can enjoy. So please don't get cold feet and show you're a fan of GBH when you go out and about wearing these smart new socks and support GBH, a station with soul. You can look good and feel good wearing your new GBH socks. Give $5 a month or $60 all at once, whatever works for you. It's so easy. So please go to wgbh.org slash support events and you can click on the link that just popped up in the chat and contribute what you can. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Now back to Edgar.
Thank you, Sarah. Five dollars a month. Get those socks. Very, very nice. So uh, we are shortly going to talk with travel writer Christopher Muther. But before we do that, we thought we would try a little trivia. We're going to do this a different way. So if you've been with us for one of these virtual Boston talks, uh, this will be new to you. And by the way, if you're with us for the first time, thank you for being here. Uh, we hope you will continue to join us for our monthly Boston Talks, but also all the uh, virtual events that GBH has going on. So uh, let's try to play a little trivia right now. So what we're going to do here is we're basically going to bring this question up and we're going to do this like a poll. So every one of you has a chance to vote on what you think the answer is for each of these trivia questions. Um, they're going to be multiple choice. So pick your favorite and then we'll total it all up and we'll find out how the audience did. So that's the idea here. These are all vaguely travel related, keeping with our theme. So let's uh, give it a shot. Let's bring that first question up right now. All right, Boston, Massachusetts, where maybe some of you are joining us from today, is also known by what nickname? Beantown, the hub, the city on a hill, or all of the above? <clears throat> so just pop your answer there into that poll and uh, we will very shortly total it up. So uh, take a look, think about what you're gonna do, but don't hesitate. We're gonna try to get through a bunch of questions uh, here before we kick things over to our next speaker. So let's see what the results are. What do we think here? We got 61% who say it is all of the above and actually everybody's right because it is all of the above, uh, but also it is technically known by each of the other ones as well. So. All of those would have been correct, uh, and they are correct. So well done. All right, so we're going to try to make these a little bit more challenging from here on out. So let's bring our second question up. If you take a trip to America's oldest brewery, you are heading to what state? Would you be staying here in Massachusetts, going to Missouri, heading down to Georgia, or going to Pennsylvania? So we are looking for uh, America's oldest brewery being located in what U.S. state? Get those answers in. Give you about uh, five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. Let's get the total, see what we think. 40% of you say it is Massachusetts. Just a few of you think it's Missouri. Almost nobody thinks it's Georgia. And 74 of you, 51% think it is Pennsylvania. And you are correct, it is Pennsylvania, Pottsville, Pennsylvania in Schuylkill County, Yingling Brewery, the oldest brewery in America. All right, let's go on to question number three. <clears throat> Europe's largest Arabic film festival is held annually in what city? Would that be Malmo, Sweden, Galway, Ireland, Cannes, France, or Hamburg, Germany? We're looking for Europe's largest Arabic Film Festival. It's held annually in one of these European cities. And uh, pick, your, uh, pick your poison here. Malmo, Sweden, Galway, Ireland, Cannes, France, or Hamburg, Germany. What do we think? Most of you think it is in Hamburg, Germany. We got that at 45%. Next would be Cannes, France at 32%. Just a few of you thought it might be Galway and about 25, 25 of you thought it was Malmo, Sweden, which it is. It is actually in Malmo, Sweden. Uh, they began, I think in 2002, holding this festival. So it's been going on for a number of years now. All right, next question. You are planning to spend a ton of cash on your vacay. You just exchange your dollars for forint. Where are you headed? You're going to be spending lots of foreign in what country? Greece, Hungary, Latvia, or Romania? So we're looking for the place whose currency is the foreign. Is it Greece, Hungary, Latvia, or Romania? Get those answers in. And let's see the results. What do we think? Most of us think it is Latvia coming in at 44%. And then Hungary at 32%, which is the correct answer. I believe it is in Hungary, the Hungarian foreign. Uh, and for what it's worth, apparently the foreign is worth about three cents, 0 0.033, sorry. Yeah, 0 0.033 dollars. A foreign is, uh, so that's about three cents. So that sounds probably like an advantageous uh, exchange rate. Although maybe I'll ask Christopher if he's been to Hungary and if things cost a lot of foreign, which I assume they do. All right, next question. 
In what year could you first travel across the entirety of the country from coast to coast on a train? So that's from east to west or west to east, coast to coast on a train. 1837, 1896, 1908, or 1915. So basically here we are looking for the year that the transcontinental railroad was completed. So let's uh, bring those answers up here. Most of you thinks it, think it was 1896, and you're right. 1896 was the answer. 67 of you getting that correct. Of course, the golden spike was put down in Box Elder, Missouri, I think, is potentially where the golden spike was put down, I believe. Uh, somebody will correct me if I'm wrong about that. Next question. Okay, in what Southern US city do hundreds of thousands of people descend every year for a very big St. Patrick's Day celebration? Is that in Dublin, Florida, Little Rock, Arkansas, Savannah, Georgia, or Charleston, South Carolina? Now, that's not to say some of these other cities might not have St. Patrick's Day celebrations. It is of course celebrated all over the country, indeed all over the world, including here in Boston. Uh, but uh, this, this uh, Southern city is uh, known in particular for their St. Patrick's Day celebration where they uh, get usually around half a million people coming down for a big parade and festival. So let's see what the answer is. Most of you went with Dublin, Florida, which is an actual town and would make sense since it is called Dublin and is named Dublin after Dublin, Ireland. But the answer is Savannah, Georgia. 36 of you got that right. That's 25% of you got that right. Uh, that celebration in Savannah, Georgia started way back in the 1800s. They've been doing it yearly down there with a parade since the 1800s. All right, next question. <clears throat> okay, this travel guide was launched in Cambridge by Harvard students in 1960. Would that be Frommer's Lonely Planet, Let's Go, or Photos? All of these uh, travel guides still available. Uh, at your local bookstore, if you can find a local bookstore, certainly all available online uh, for a purchase. But which of these was actually launched by Harvard students in Cambridge in 1960? Let's see what we think. Most of you say Lonely Planet. That's 51% of you saying Lonely Planet. The actual answer came in number two here at 35%, and that is Let's Go. Let's Go started in 1960 by Harvard students, still around today. All right, let's move on to our next question. Which of these is a real town? Which is a real place? Lobsterham, Maine, Frackville, Pennsylvania, Loggertown, Wisconsin, or Potatoburg, Idaho? One of these towns and only one of these towns is an actual town. I want you to pop in which one you think is a real place. Lobster Ham, Maine, Frackville, Pennsylvania, Loggertown, Wisconsin, or Potatoburg, Idaho. Let's see what you think. Brrr. Most of you have gone with Loggertown, Wisconsin. 59% of you say Loggertown, Wisconsin, but that is incorrect. No, the correct answer is Frackville, Pennsylvania which happens to be the town where I was born, my hometown of Frackville, Pennsylvania, not named for fracking, though fracking has become uh, quite a big deal in Pennsylvania. It's actually named after a man named Daniel Frack. Frackville, Pennsylvania, very close to Pottsville, Pennsylvania, the home of Yingling Brewery. All right, just a few more questions left here. You guys are doing pretty good. Let's see how we do on these final questions. Let's bring one up. All right, you are finally checking Victoria Falls off your bucket list. So you're gonna go see this, uh, this natural wonder of the world at the border between what two African countries? Zambia and Zimbabwe, Angola and Namibia, Sudan and Chad, or Kenya and Tanzania? Victoria Falls is uh, right between two African countries. Which two do you think that is? Let's see how we did. And 54% of you, bang on the nose, got it right. Very well done, very impressive. It is indeed right there on the border between Zambia and Zimbabwe. Very, very impressive there. 
Very good job, everybody. All right, we've got just two questions left. Let's bring them up. Let's see if we can finish strong, gang. All right, just south of Dollywood in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, you can visit a museum that is dedicated solely to what? Paintings on toilet seats, bananas, wreaths made of human hair, or salt and pepper shakers. So there is a museum in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, very close to Dollywood, about 12 miles away, 12 miles south, uh, that is dedicated solely to one of these items. Let's see what we think collectively. Man, nailed it. In fact, almost 73% of you got that correct. I don't know if everybody knows about the Salt and Pepper Shaker Museum or everybody just had great guesses there, but really well done. That is absolutely true. It is worth noting the rest of them are also actual museums. Uh, the Toilet Seat Painting Museum is in Texas. Uh, the International Banana Museum is in California, and uh, the Human Hair Museum, which includes a lot of wreaths, but also jewelry made of human hair, is in Missouri. All right, one last question. Let's see if we can finish off strong. I think we got two in a row. Uh, you have just hiked the entire Appalachian Trail. Well done, you. How many U.S. states did you just visit on your trip along the entirety of the Appalachian Trail? Would that be 11? 12, 13, or 14 states that the Appalachian Trail goes through. Get those numbers in. Let's see if we can finish strong with a final victory for all of us together collectively on this trivia question. Bring it up. What did we do? What do we say? We say 12. 32% of us say 12. Not quite, but we came in. The 27% of us, so the second most popular answer, is the right answer which is 14, 14 states, starting in Georgia, moving all the way up through Massachusetts and into Maine. Well done, everybody. Thank you for playing trivia with us. Uh, really appreciate it. Good job. I think, uh, I think we were somewhere around getting half of those right, which is very impressive. So nicely done, everybody. <clears throat> and uh, let's bring Christopher Muther out and talk travel with uh, one of the premier travel writers of the area. Christopher Muther, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being with us. Travel writer, uh, travel columnist for the Boston Globe. Um, so we're in a pandemic and travel was a complete no-no for a while, probably still pretty difficult to do right now. How are you doing your job? <laughs> you know, I've been on vacation since March, so it's been easy. No, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of people have asked me, how I've managed to do my job, you know, what happens to a travel writer during a pandemic. And at first I completely panicked uh, and was wondering the same thing. What am I supposed to do? But as it turns out, as the world sort of collapsed upon itself, it was very easy to kind of write about how it was the travel world, I mean, collapsing on itself. And as borders were closing, as people were trying to get out, as, can't, as trips were getting canceled, and people were looking to get refunds. There was a lot of consumer reporting. There was a lot of industry reporting as the airlines kind of went down, um, as the number of people going through TSA and travel. There were just a lot of, initially, a lot of stories about um, the industry kind of disintegrating, hotels falling apart. Um, it's really interesting when I think back to February, it was late January or early February, the first story I wrote about um, COVID was, is Boston going to end up losing a lot of Chinese tourists because the Chinese aren't allowed to come over? And when I think back to it, you know, just kind of the spread and the enormity of it after that, it's just to think that we went from that to where we are now is, um, is pretty mind boggling. But yeah. to answer your question more specifically, um, I slowly started emerging um, in the spring and started traveling because people wanted to start getting out locally. They weren't ready to get on planes. I think a lot of people aren't ready to get on planes unless it's to see family. Um, so I think my first sort of foray was I went to Providence and I rented a yacht 
and that sounds a little <laughs> grandiose, but it was uh, it was more of like say a shanty. It was <laughs> be a boat. It was a barnacle bar barge. That's what I would call it. Um, uh, but I wanted to stay on a boat because I thought I'm not in a hotel. I don't have to deal with elevators or other people. I just walk down the ramp to the marina and I'm on my Airbnb boat. Um, and Providence during the summer was empty because the schools weren't around. So from there, I kind of gained confidence in terms of you know, doing some local travel stories. Yeah, speaking of local travel, uh, Dawn here in the Q&A um, sort of asked a question a while ago, sort of saying, do you have any thoughts on local travel to other New England states? And I know that's something that sort of in response to this pandemic, you have done a lot of. So I wonder if you can maybe have some tips and thoughts for Don about traveling around locally to other New England states. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things right now that I would say, regardless of where you're going in the country, is to just look at those maps and see what the positivity rates are. Um, see where they're going up, where they're going down, and also see where um, people from Massachusetts are allowed to go without quarantining upon return. Um, so that's just sort of my first, you know, Rhode Island right now, probably not, but Maine is very safe. Vermont, we're technically not allowed to go to. Vermont has divided up Massachusetts into counties. And if you're in a county that's red, you're not really allowed to go without quarantining procedures. So if you're in the Boston area, you can knock Vermont off your list. Um, Maine, people from Massachusetts can now go to. Uh, but the things that I've been doing this summer and into the fall, this has been the most time I've ever spent in New England in about a decade, which has been nice to be able to rediscover it. Um, you know, my recommendations are sort of not to, to think about things that other people wouldn't think about because when everyone started going out to go camping or to go hiking, everybody had the same idea. So it sort of defeated the purpose of doing it. Um, you know, like the beaches this summer, they were all mobbed because people just wanted to get out and they kind of did the same thing. So I, you know, my response to all of that was just to go to Providence because I also am a city guy. So I really wanted to go to the city. Um, I went to Maine back when I had to be tested to go to Maine um, because I needed to bring my parents up so they could have their annual vacation. Um, I went to the mountains in New Hampshire with my niece and kind of escaped there. I just needed to go to places that were sort of peaceful um, and not crowded. So my advice would be for New England travel is one, you know, carefully look at where we can go, what the positivity rates are. And then on top of that, try to think a little differently, you know, find an Airbnb on a remote lake. Um, do things that you've never done before, but also will kind of take you away from the craziness of day to day. Yeah. How do you, how do we, where do we go to sort of get the most up-to-date information about like where we can, like can and can't go and like, like how, do, how do we like know that? You know what I mean? Like, so Vermont, you say we can't go unless you quarantine. That's technically at all, right? I can't even drive into Vermont, spend a couple hours and then head back or can I? Um, you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. You know, that's actually one of the things that states don't want when they're kind of holding people off. You know, like if someone came into Massachusetts from another state, they theoretically aren't supposed to come in as a day tripper. That's kind of even worse because yeah. you could come in and inadvertently spread um, COVID without knowing it. So, you know, for instance, my recommendation would be if you're planning to go to a state is just to go to the state's website or go to the state's tourism website. And you can always find it easily by just Googling the name of the state. And, you know, it's super helpful to do. Um, and then also people have been asking since some countries are starting to reopen to the US or about to, um, how to find that information. And you can go to the CDC website or the Department of State website and they'll tell you their countries that we can and can't go to. And they'll also issue an advisory level Right now, they're all kind of fours and fives in terms of not to travel to. Um, but 
you can get all of your information there, but I really do encourage people just take a few minutes to do some research before you start booking tickets and getting fanciful ideas in your head because I've done it too many times. I get excited about going to a place and then I realize I can't go there. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of that, um, a couple of questions. Uh, Susan uh, asks, where are the travel bargains right now? And, <laughs> and do you think things like gift cards for air or train travel are a good idea right now as well? Interesting. So, you know, there's so many travel bargains right now um, in terms of flights, um, you know, specifically. So this time of year, normally um, flights to Caribbean countries would be a small fortune. And, you know, this year we can't get to a lot of them yet. Some of them are opening December 1st. Um, I think Costa Rica may have already opened. Curacao, I think, is open now. But, um, you know, buying flights is a little bit of a crapshoot. It is and it isn't because all of the airlines now have these great cancellation policies that they've never had before. There's no change fee um, if you buy tickets. So worst comes to worst, you keep canceling and rebooking your flights. But there are, you know, there are places to go. I see deals all the time. There's something called Dollar Flight Club, which you can sign up for online. There's a free version and a not free version. Um, and I'm on the free version. But, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to, uh, to find. You know, I would just honestly say, if you've got a hankering to go somewhere and a general idea of when, to go to Google Flights. And to just kind of look and you can kind of play around with your destinations and figure it out. But yes, strangely, the world right now is filled with um, travel bargains and we can't go anywhere. Yeah. Have you, you know, you, you talk about early on and your first sort of tiptoeing out uh, and staying in a yacht. Uh, since then, <laughs> have you have you traveled various ways like have and have you stayed in hotels and sort of what have you learned kind of by doing that, that you might be able to share with us who are thinking about doing that kind of thing? Sure. Um, I have mostly traveled by car so far. Um, and the longest trip I took was to Wildwood, New Jersey. And I drove there and it felt like the longest drive of my life. Yeah. Uh, but in terms, so driving is the safest. I mean, there's no zero risk way of getting anywhere unless you are you know holed up in your house and not going anywhere but um yeah so i've taken a, a car and you know one of the questions i get is well what happens if i need to stop and use the restroom or that sort of thing and you know there's some pretty common sense things you look and see you know does it look like a sketchy rest area does it look relatively clean is it busy is it not busy um as long as you generally follow um, safety protocols, you know, wear your mask, wash your hands, use hand sanitizer. I haven't had any problems doing that. And like I said, I've, I've driven everywhere and I knock on wood, haven't run into any issues yet. Um, in terms of hotels, um, you, know, you were talking to Dr. Karan earlier about surfaces and surface transmission of coronavirus. Um, you know, I started going into hotels earlier um, than, you know, some of these studies came out. And so I have a kit that I bring with me, which is, <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Uh, I have a, a can of Lysol, I have some disinfecting wipes, um, uh, and then I also have some, some other sprays and ointments and liniments and potions that I sort of spread all around. No, it's, you know, I feel like once I'm in a room, it's totally fine. Again, I haven't had issues. And the other thing about staying in a hotel now is that housekeeping does not come into your room while you're there. So you don't have a chambermaid um, housekeeping coming in and potentially breathing and spreading molecules in the air unless you want them to come in and drop off towels or whatever when you're not there. But hotels in general, again, right now are a bargain um, people don't want to stay in them. Um, 
obviously, which is why occupancy rates have gone far down. But I've stayed in a few. My experiences have been um, generally positive. Uh, you know, as Dr. Karan was saying, essentially the trick of it is to avoid being around other people. You just have to be as antisocial as possible with this <laughs> Great. with this virus. And and thankfully, I already am. So it's perfect. Yeah. Perfect. You've been waiting for this moment your whole life. It really, I, I'm the introvert of introverts. So it's perfect. Uh, we got uh, Sanjay who asked, you, you mentioned that there's these great new policies for cancellations or changing flights. Is it the same for hotels? Do they, have they sort of also made it easier to sort of, maybe I'm going to be there, but I might have to cancel? They've made it much easier. Um, again, it depends on often where you reserve your hotel. Uh, when you reserve through the hotel directly, um, and if you think there's a chance of cancellation, I would recommend re reserving through the hotel. Often, and this was pre-pandemic, you can choose a rate that is higher that allows you to cancel. Yeah. Um, and I always, if, if you have the money to do that, I would do that. But the answer to that is yes, um, they are better about it. The other thing I would recommend is if you're not a member of any sort of loyalty program of the hotel, if it's a chain to sign up for it, because members often have additional benefits like uh, free cancellation or the ability to move um, your stay. Yeah. You know, Spending a little bit more time in New England than you have in the past, and you sort of said you've been enjoying rediscovering it. What what are some what are some sort of places or things that you've done that have caught your eye and maybe surprised you and kind of made you go like, oh yeah, I forgot how great this is. <laughs> you know, um, we were talking about Maine earlier, and I hadn't been to York Beach in Maine since I was a little boy, and. I just kind of forgotten about, you know, the place where they pull the saltwater taffy that you can watch uh, the golden rod. Um, and also, you know, I hadn't been to Vermont in forever. And we, I went to a place that was ranked the top resort in the Northeast, which really shouldn't have been ranked the top <laughs> resort in the Northeast. But um, there was something about this wonderful pace of being there. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm kind of a city guy and I live right in the heart of the city. And when you're in Vermont in the middle of nowhere um, and you can see the sky and, you know, it's just a very different feel. But one of the other things, this wasn't in Vermont, but in Maine and in other places, we were talking about this earlier, is how if you're in a smaller town where there's not as many tourists, people may not wear their masks. And that's something that's... Uh, you know, a little jarring if you see yeah. people not wearing masks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've got uh, I've got just one more question left for Chris, and I'm going to ask him that big question in just a moment. But before I do that, I'm going to welcome back my colleague Sarah for one final message for you. Thanks, Edgar. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to our event this evening. Uh, now more than ever, it's crucial to stay informed about what is happening in the world and your backing helps us provide information that you can trust, along with events that you can enjoy. Today, when you make a gift of $5 a month on our sustainer plan, you can choose to receive these WGBH logo pattern socks. You can look good and feel good wearing them. All it takes is $5 a month or give $60 all at once, whatever is easiest for you. And to do so, go to wgbh.org slash support events. You can make a donation and receive these socks as a token of our thanks. To make it easy for you, we actually just dropped the link in the chat, so you can go ahead and click that. Anyways, back to you, Edgar. Thank you, Sarah. All right, Chris, we are almost out of time, so I do want to I do want to kind of get your answer to this uh, question. So let's let's put on our positivity hats and imagine a world where this whole pandemic thing has finally blown over one way or another. We have an effective vaccine and effective treatment against it, and the world opens back up again. Where, where are you going first? Like, and <laughs> give, me, give me why that place is so great so that I can, over the next few weeks and months, just imagine myself going there. So this is an important question to your question. Am I going for work or am I going for personal vacation? Personal, like as a person who is a, well, let's do it this way. 
Okay. Like, I'm the person who's a travel writer, not necessarily for work, but not just because you need a break and you want to sit on a beach all this, like just, and do nothing but that, right? Like, so just like, but like a, as, as Christopher Muther person, amazing yep. destination that now you realize since you haven't been able to travel, you need to go there before you can't ever go there again. Oh, that's a really tough question. So I can, I, I'm going to give you several answers just Great. because I can, and I'm going to make up my own rules. Uh, the first place that sprung to mind for me was Lake Como in Italy, because it's just such a wonderful, beautiful place. Um, the food is amazing. The people are amazing. You know, it's Italy, so it's kind of great. Um, after that, I would go back to Santiago, Chile, um, which I thought was this kind of wonderful cosmopolitan, but not too full of itself city. Um, and then I would head back to Europe and find some lakes to bike around because that's one of my favorite things to do is to get on a bike and go around a lake with a bunch of people. And I'll throw in one more thing, which is going to sound absurd. Do it. But I want to go on a cruise again. Really? Yes. Uh, I know. Even the fact that I... Really? Look, the heart wants what the heart wants. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you know. I know, I know. <laughs> Anywhere. All right, Christopher Muther, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for joining us for our Boston Talks. Um, we will be back next month. And as I said before, there are all kinds of GBH virtual events that are happening. Whatever it is that you are into, I am sure that we have something for you. So check us out online. Keep an eye on the events happening. Thank you for your support. Thank you for being with us for this uh, last hour. I've really enjoyed being with you. Stay safe out there. Wash those hands, wear that mask, and be good to each other. Have a good night, everybody. See ya.